Actors Troy Baker and Ashley Johnson return to add so much heart, honesty, joy, and sadness to the roles as Joel and Ellie respectively. It's uncomfortable and outdated mechanics make you feel frustratingly trapped. The artfully detailed and realized locations Ellie travels through are layered with backstory. It just feels cruel. Those clever designs are dressed with some of the most beautiful environments I've seen from the PlayStation 4 generation. This game just feels constantly punishing for no reason. While Part 2 is a thrilling adventure, it still makes time for a stunning, nuanced exploration of the strength and fragility of the human spirit. Ultimately, the game winds up being an unpleasant nostalgia trip that nobody should pack their bags for. Given the recent controversy about The Last of Us 2, I bet viewers assume this is a video digging on the game or its fans. Well, I actually really don't care about The Last of Us, I just don't really like cinematic games very much to begin with, so I had very little investment in the series one way or the other. However, I predicted something like this was going to happen. The issue of the Last of Us controversy isn't fully the developer's fault or the fault of the players who were disappointed by its sequel either. At least not completely. This controversy hits something deeper than that, an issue the gaming industry has had for a long time now. And that is, put simply, that video game critics and the video game fanbase at large don't share the same tastes. Now, this isn't exclusive to video games. Anything from movies to food has critics. That's not an actual size. Is it? Maybe it is. No, no chance. No chance that's the actual size. The argument for why these people exist is that a critic is supposed to have a finer palate than that of the average consumer. The assumption goes that the uneducated masses don't really understand what is good and what isn't. The issue is, and I have statistical data to back it up, in the video game medium, critics aren't more discerning than the average gamer. In fact, it's the opposite. The power the Metacritic score has on a game's success cannot be understated. Of course, there are successful games with low scores and unsuccessful games with high scores. But to a video game publisher, a review score is a piece of marketing, and the higher that score goes, the easier it is to market their game. And it makes sense why. Video games are expensive. Unlike, say, a movie ticket, which usually only costs about $10 a viewing, a video game often costs $60 or more to purchase. So given the increased financial investment, it makes sense that while movies have a simple thumbs up or thumbs down style of review, most people aren't willing to purchase a game unless they are certain it isn't just good, but excellent, so a non-binary style of scoring system is required. But there are major issues that come from this style of system, and the result of this is developers pandering to reviewers above that of their actual fanbase. The idea of developers changing a game to appease two game journalists likely isn't a novel idea to anyone watching this video. There are multiple stories of games getting censored or changed after a game journalist makes or tries to make a controversy over a subject. What people forget is that outside of free-to-play games, which tend to not get review scores, most game developers have to think about game critics during nearly every step of a game's design, and their specific tastes are a big reason why the current video game market is the way it is today. Just using my home country of America as an example, Video game fan bases come from all cultures and interests as well as ages. You have the culturally diverse old guard of the fighting game community, then you have more casual gamers that just play whatever is advertised to them the most. There are also people who only like a specific genre of game. For example, I know a lot of people that just play League of Legends or Dota and nothing else. Tastes also change based on the demographics we are looking at. Things such as age, gender, or where you live is likely going to be a good indicator of the types of games you prefer. The diversity of the many tastes of players isn't reflected well in games journalism, however. As I will show in a bit, journalism bias doesn't affect all games equally. Like fast-paced complex action games? Sorry, most game journalists don't. Like old 90s style FPS? Well, tough luck. How about 3D platformers? Sorry, having to move vertically in 3D space is too frustrating for critics. You might just think I'm cherry picking, but no I'm not. After going through the critic versus user scores of nearly 4,000 games, there are a few clear trends I found that I would like to share which I think begin to show us the increasing divide between video game fans and the video game critics, as well as starting to explain why things have gotten to where they are today. 
The first thing I did was compare the difference between the average Metacritic score a game gets versus the same game's user score and the average difference of this by year from 1996 to 2018. The results of this is a trend that as time went on, review scores became more and more positive compared to what the general audience felt on a game. Starting in 2009, reviewers started reviewing games more positively than that of user reviews. Before that year, from 1996 to 2008, every year showed reviewers criticizing games more harshly than that of the average player. As you can see, after 2009, there wasn't a single year where critics reviewed games harsher than fans. This positivity bias was greatest in bigger budget games or games made by large publishers and smaller in indie games. So, am I implying reviewers are bought off by large corporations? After all, why would games made by megacorps get higher review scores? Well, no, I don't believe this is the case. At least not directly. You see, 2009 was around the point where print media was really starting to die and online game critics were starting to become the bulk of game reviews. Unlike print magazine, which generally shipped on a monthly basis and so had a set schedule of when a review had to be finished by, with online reviewers releasing scores on the night of or even before a game's released, suddenly getting a review in on time or among the first became extremely important to review sites since whoever released a review first is more likely to get views. While a video game publisher can't prevent reviewers from releasing a bad review of their game after a game is already released, though they have tried, they sure can determine who gets to review a game before said game releases, through the process of handing out early review copies to specific online publications. What this results in is journalists tending to be nicer when reviewing big releases or games from large corporations because as long as they aren't too harsh on a game, they'll be selected next time it's time to give out early review copies. This is why early review scores of major games are almost always better than the eventual Metacritic score a game eventually gets after it's finally released. So that more niche game you like made by a no-name company, it's not going to get the extra bump. Sorry. And again, while early review copies weren't exclusive to just online websites, it became far more important once magazines started getting phased out and replaced by gaming websites. This is likely why when comparing the difference between user and critic scores of top rated games, as in games with a score of 90% or greater, from the 5 year period of 1996 to 2001 versus 2013 to 2018, we see a drastic difference in agreement. During the turn of the millennium, there was only a 0.5 scoring difference on average compared to a whopping average of 1.8 point difference. 1.8 might not at first sound too bad, but that's the difference between a game getting a 7.2 out of 10 versus a 9 out of 10. Now, I don't think early review copies are the only issue causing this huge difference in opinion. Going back to what I said about diversity, the simple fact is that video game critics don't have the same player diversity or experience as many of the fans of the medium. Looking at available information from the writers of gaming websites, it quickly becomes clear that the average video game critic is a male in their mid-twenties to early thirties that live in a major city on the west coast, most likely San Francisco. This might at first seem like a trivial bit of information, but it's important when understanding the specific bias game reviewers have. The fighting game community, for example, is much bigger in some areas of the United States than in others. It's also no secret that Texas is the holy land for Quake and Doom players. Taking this further, these sites serve the entire English-speaking world, not just a single country. Different countries contain players with differing tastes. If you are a developer that lives in, say, the UK, for example, you're going to have your game reviewed by majorly West Coast Americans. This is just conjecture on my end, but could this explain why most video games these days take place in America despite video games being developed by people from all around the world? Now, maybe what I said before wouldn't be so bad if video game reviewers were highly experienced players with a breadth of knowledge in the medium. If this were the case, maybe they could handle their innate biases to what games they do and don't like. But the sad fact is, is that nepotism, not knowledge of the subject matter, is often how people get hired in this industry. Given this, it makes sense that most game critics live within a stone's throw of each other. It's a group of people that, for the most part, happen to know each other. This also explains the embarrassing lack of skill you often see from video game reviewers or their preferences for easier games. Remember that Spongebob review at the beginning of the video? Here's that same reviewer not being able to figure out a quote-unquote 
puzzle made for literal children. Not only could a child solve this puzzle, actual ocean invertebrates solve more complex puzzles. As has been shown time and time again, a lot of these people aren't fit to be the vanguards of the gaming industry. And this shows in the data. Spongebob wasn't the only platformer to get reviewed negatively by critics. Despite most games getting reviewed higher than fan reviews, 3D platformers get nearly a 0.5 reduction on average in review scores compared to user assessments. When we take Nintendo platformers out of the picture, this raises to nearly 0.6. The final, and in my opinion, greatest bias reviewers bring to a game review is that honestly, they didn't really get a chance to experience the game the way they were meant to be played. When you get a game to review, you have a deadline. What does this mean? It means beating the game on the easiest difficulty, turning on cheats, or avoiding combat altogether, because gosh darn it, it's Tuesday and I need to get this review up by tomorrow, or I'm in serious trouble with my boss. So, think I'm just talking out of my hat? Reviewers admit to doing this all the time. And not just for The Last of Us either, pretty much for any big game. Here's one of the worst examples. In my boot camp, reviewers were charging through missions wearing the chicken hat, which makes you invisible, almost completely ignoring Mother Base and all the side ops in the race for the end. Many, if not all, of the reviews that are already online were written by journalists who were forced to play MGS5 for 8 hours every day, in regimented time slots, while under instructions to share only the information that was deemed necessary by Konami higher-ups. And when they don't go out and admit it, oftentimes it's found out anyway. If you beat a game but experience less than half of its content, or just rush through its content, do you really think you could give said game an honest review? Deadlines suck, but that's no excuse for rushing a review which will ultimately create an uninformed assessment of the product being reviewed. So let's put this all together. What do you get? Well, I did notice, and likely others have too, that game reviewers tend to really like certain types of games over others. Among the genres that showed the highest positivity bias, third-person cinematic games and walking simulators showed a 0.8 and 0.95 bump respectively. So think about it. If you're a person who likely only plays video games casually and are given a strict deadline of when you have to be and review a game, what game's going to be the most enjoyable to you? Let's say you've got to get your review out by tomorrow. So you enable cheats, put the game on the easiest difficulty, avoid most content, and just rush to beat it as fast as possible. What in the game can you actually honestly review? You can't give the combat or balancing a fair shake. You likely aren't an experienced enough player to understand the ins and outs of a game's combat system either. So what's left? Well, maybe the graphics were nice, or maybe you love the story or voice acting. Maybe a certain character character was funny to you. So the most enjoyable games are going to be the ones that deliver on these aspects. Even I admit, if I only had a weekend to play a game, I probably wouldn't pick the most technical fighter or some 200 IQ RTS. By the time my time is up, I wouldn't have even understood the most basic gameplay elements yet, and I definitely wouldn't have enjoyed the experience much. I probably would have enjoyed a nice story-focused game more instead. You can see this in the reviews for The Last of Us 2. Despite the fact that you spend around 90% of the game in combat or sneaking or managing resources, the story, animations, and characters make up the vast majority of the content of these reviews. Why? Because they're the only parts the critic got a decent taste of. Everything else is the reviewer playing the game of, guess on very little actual experience, what you think the things you're reviewing is like. If you like The Last of Us 2 or any other games reviewers also like, I'm not trying to insult you. I'm just showing that these are the types of games critics, by the very nature of the review system, are going to gravitate to. And because of this, these are also the types of games big name developers are also going to gravitate to as well. Because they know it tends to lead to better reviews. This is almost certainly why The Last of Us 2 has the option to enable a button that literally makes your character invisible to enemies. Because they know this is something that a reviewer almost certainly wants, and makes the playtime of the reviewer more enjoyable. This is also likely why the new Crash game is getting an unlimited lives mode in its new installment. The sad fact is, is that because review scores mean so much for the sales of a game, it simply becomes riskier as a big time publisher to make the games you know reviewers aren't going to like. It stifles the diversity and creativity of the games publishers are willing to fund because they know critics have a narrow range of games they are willing to like. This hurts gaming because it means a wide array of diverse tastes and people that play games aren't being properly catered to. It's well known that game journalists tend to really care about diversity and representation. 
or at the very least they say they do. But because of the bias that comes from game critics being such a homogenous group themselves, many of the cultures that reside within gaming aren't getting the representation they really need. And that's a sense that the outside world cares about your hobby in the same way you do. Think for example of the fighting game community, a community made up in large part by poorer communities that started as gatherings around arcades. How often do gaming critics show an appreciation for the deep and complex mechanics this genre has to show? Or what of Eastern European games? It's no secret that Western games media has a bias against what many have considered Eurojank. Often critics see these games as frustratingly unfunctional and up to snorefests, but to their fans and the cultures that create them, their unique and creative experiences made resourcefully and out of love. And don't get me started on the cultural atomic bomb that is game critics and their disdain for the expression of Japanese devs. Reviewers need to see genres on their own terms rather than through the lens they often get both from their background and the short amount of time they get to assess a game. A lot of these reviewers are predisposed to not liking certain food items, and I don't think that's right. I mean, they're, they're the reviewer after all. They're, they're supposed to have the professional palate and be able to tell me if a tomato is crisp or not crisp, they can't just throw it off and be like, I don't review tomatoes. Oh, oh, what are you, fucking gay? So, what's my solution to this? Should only gaming experts like me get review copies? No, I don't think so. There are some types of games I simply don't care for, but that doesn't mean I think these games deserve a low score because of it. The major issue of the Metacritic is that the best games aren't going to be the ones that are liked by everyone, but instead the ones loved by the specific group of people they pander to. A piece of art that speaks to you specifically is always going to be the piece of art that we personally like the most. As I said earlier, I don't like cinematic games. Does that mean all cinematic games deserve low scores? Of course not. Rather than traditional Metacritic reviews, we should transition to more accurate and personal review systems. Traditional game reviews are kind of obsolete in the year 2020. Most people don't even read gaming site reviews, they just check the score. Sites like YouTube allow people to broadcast detailed opinions of games, and unlike random IGN reviews, you likely know if said content creator has tastes similar to yours. But an even better review system, in my opinion, is that of the user review system. Not necessarily the user review system that Metacritic has, but the system sites like Steam have. Steam used to display the Metacritic score on a game store page, but later replaced it with user scores, but more importantly, these are from users that have already purchased and played the game. This means that the reviewers have already been self-selected for being into the specific type of game or genre the product is from, and likely have more expertise in it. Not only that, but unlike game journal scores, Steam review scores can update continuously, which better reflect the state of a game as time goes on, and gives players as much time as they want before reviewing a game. Sure. This might result in games that the general populace wouldn't be into getting a score far higher than what reviewers would give it, but let's be honest, if you're looking at the user review scores of a Japanese dating sim, it's because you already have an interest in Japanese dating sims. This has worked wonders for the games that the major gaming websites aren't willing to touch, or games that are in early access. Do I think Steam's user review system is perfect? No but I do think it's a step in the right direction, and definitely a better option than what the current dogma is. To close, I feel there's a lot of information that can come from this data set I've been collecting and going through. As time goes on, I hope to update it and make a more comprehensive list showcasing reviewer bias as it applies to genres, publishers, and developers. If nothing else, maybe it could help players determine a better assessment of a game's quality than just what gaming review sites decide.